What was the biggest su success for you? Or is there something you regret in your whole career? Maybe a film or something to say, oh, I should have better not done this movie. I was studying architecture when I decided to make films. And maybe what I regret is that I didn't finish architecture. And <laughs> Probably if I had done that, I would regret not quitting architecture, etc. But uh, now, to tell you the truth, I used to be very autocritical when I saw my films, once I just finished them. But now, I'll, to tell you the truth, I forgot about them. I mean, I haven't seen them for a long time. I don't want to see them. I'm sure that I'm, I'm going to dislike many things. But there's nothing I can do about it, so uh, what's the use? Last time I saw them was precisely when I made this, uh, and not, not really see them, but check them, when, uh, when I opened this page. And in cases like the John Reed that we were talking about, and just to check that the version was the new version, not the old version, etc. But um, there are many things I don't like, but uh, what's the use of uh, lamenting myself many years afterwards that I should have done whatever I you know. um, The Latin American history seems very, very important for you, but also the political stories you saw in your movies. Why is it so important for you? What is the special thing about that that you put always in your films? Well, it was a political moment. I still believe it, but it, it started in, um, I think everything started with the Cuban Revolution that gave us, from a political point of view, the idea that we are, that we belong to a continent, not only to a country. And uh, for instance, we were talking about changes. On the plane now here, and I, uh, I have it in the hotel because I didn't end it, the reading of the couple of articles. There was one in Le Monde about the uh, Venice uh, Biennale that has just opened a few days ago, with interviews of people from, as far as I remember, from Israel, from Bahamas, from Germany, some other clear places supporting the idea of this year Venice uh, Viennale that the pavilions that usually been there for I don't know how many years shouldn't be representing countries because according to them uh, countries are no more important for art and Germany for instance as far as I remember is presenting four uh, artists for one Chinese, one from India, no, I don't know from where, and, only, and the guy that was the curator, which is a new invention, the curators, uh, almost uh, complains that he, has, he had to use also uh, a German, a German uh, author. Bahamas, which is an almost non-existent country, claims it's more or less the same thing. Uh, that idea uh, for my generation is absolutely shocking and ridiculous. I would say absurd, I would add. I'm not against globalization, but I, I, I think it's absurd to try to ignore the differences for good or for bad, but I mean the obvious differences, in, in, in especially from a cultural point of view. Uh, in the existence of, of countries. No? And it's a bit absurd that a country like Israel is claiming that it's not important the fact that he's a, it's a country when the, the, the fight of Israel has been too great with all the problems that I'm not going into details, but you know, uh, imply the idea of making Israel a country in that place, etc. So I think that. That's why I say I think it's ridiculous. For us in, in my generation, it was a completely different thing. It was the 
to start, uh, and especially in countries like Mexico. Mexico is a country with a very important history. I mean, it has, it has a history uh, for centuries, uh, back to the pyramids and archaeology and all that. We have uh, uh, antecedents for, 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 for what we are. The fact that we, uh, the arrival of the Europeans started in Mexico, or places like Mexico, uh, the revolutions and all kind of social movement that we had all along uh, for centuries, and even the actual situation being in the border with the United States, and the other side Cuba, and the other side Guatemala, I mean, it's impossible to ignore what, where are you and, and what's going on in your country and, and, and with your neighbors. So uh, I remember in the 70s I went to Venezuela to one of the first meetings, Latin American meetings, uh, of filmmakers trying to organize ourselves and from that uh, committee of Latin American filmmakers was was uh, was created, and from that, the school that Fernando Dirri uh, finally directed in, 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 in near Havana in San Antonio de los Baños, and the Fundación del Nuevo Cine Latinoamericano that Gabriel García Márquez uh, presides were created, and I remember that in that meeting, since it was the first time that. We met like here in a table and discussing ourselves. Started with uh, with uh, the guys from Venezuela, which were organizing the, the meeting. Asked to everybody to first of all say, "I'm Paul Duke. I come from Mexico. Mexico is a country that uh, the North has frontier with the United States, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera, et cetera. And in that context, talk about our history a little bit and and then how films start to be done, etc., etc. And after we all spoke, I remember that the guys from Venezuela, uh, and I remember it was a documentary filmmaker, a good guy, a very nice guy and good uh, filmmaker, said something that sounded a bit conventional at the beginning, but it was completely real. And he said, after listening to all of you, we are, we've been discussing every night after we hear, listen to you, we go to, have a drink and discuss ourselves. And we found very impressed by the fact that you come from countries that have an history, history, because we don't have a history. And it was, I felt uh, cold when I, when, I, when I heard that, because I found out that it's a fact. There are countries that really, and now you see all the, what's going on in Venezuela, but if you go to Venezuela, you find that all the streets have Bolivar name or Miranda name, but they don't even have enough heroes to, 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 to put the name, in, you know, which in Mexico or in India or in Brazil, in some country we have a very important history in some others, it, in especially in Latin America, Central America, are recent countries created more or less in the 19th century because of divisions, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Panama or was part of Colombia, Etc. Etc. So it's very difficult. But also, that the, when you start thinking about those things and discussing about those things, and we started the sort of discussion, in the, as, I, as I said, because of the influence mainly for my generation of the Cuban Revolution, uh, there's no escape. I mean, it really gives you a way of thinking. A gener we had a generational way of thinking in which the fact that you belong to a country and that country belonged to Latin America was very important because, for instance, myself, when I, when I, when I apart from politics, only to talk about cinema, when I decided to become a filmmaker, in Mexico there were no film schools. Now there are a few, but at the time there weren't. Uh, there was no Cinematheque, and uh, I went to Paris to study in, in Midec and uh, films, and 
there was the Cinémathèque Française, and there were some Pesar Film Festival and some other film festival where people from Latin America met. We had to come to Europe. I met uh, all the cinema novo, Brazilian, Glauber Rocha, Rui Guerra, etc., etc. I met them in, in, in Italy or in Berlin or in Paris. Uh, that also gave us some sort of a conscious that we were more or less in the same situation. I mean, when you compare yourself with the Brazilians, so they were older than myself, but they were in the same situation. And um, that started that movement that uh, still exists, although has changed and uh, not exactly the same in many ways. But uh, of isn't it a big advantage that in Latin America you have a common language as a filmmaker and you have like an, an audience uh, that can the films can can uh, be. Yeah, it sounds like that, but in the like fact, like but that? in the fact, it's not so easy. Because uh, it's like the joke we always want to make that you you used to come to Europe and and, and, and or go to a study, another place, and they say, oh, you come from Mexico. I have a cousin in Argentina, and maybe you know him. No, but I mean from Mexico to Argentina is more than from here to Japan. I mean, it's completely. So we have the same language, but it's a huge continent. And uh, with many historically political problems, economical problems, so it has been very difficult to create a possibility of organization of any kind. In the case of films, for, let's say for distribution, uh, you have the language that opens the door for for your film to be shown in Venezuela or, or Argentina or Republica Dominicana. But the situation in Argentina, etc., etc., or the Republica Dominicana are completely different. And little by little, most of the countries of Latin America, if we talk only about films, it's more obvious, depend, as we were talking before, of the American films and the American distribution are controlled by, by Hollywood. So it becomes as difficult as to show your film in Japan, or almost, maybe not so much, but almost. No? Film school in Havana is like Latin American film school. They come people yeah. from, from the whole continent. Yeah. Okay. And Frida, we saw Frida and we saw Morocco. And it was a very experimental movie, a film, which keeps words to an absolute minimum. So my question is, what is your intention by using this absence of dialogue? This no words, uh, how shall I say? Say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you use no narrative, any narrative sequences. Why are you doing that? What is your intention? Why not? It's, it's different. <laughs> it seems different for, for someone who is normally watching movies with a lot of dialogues and stuff like that. But why not? That is great. <laughs> Don't <laughs> no. misunderstand me. No, 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 no. There is a provocation in the book for you. It started because it started with, uh, with, uh, with uh, when I make, make the, when we wrote uh, the script for Frida. In fact, we started with another, with another character. We were going to do a film on Tina Modotti. I don't know if you know who Tina Modotti was, which is more or less in the same period of life, also in Mexico. She was an Italian. Um, she became a photographer in Mexico. She she had a relationship with Edward Weston, the, photo the American photographer. They went to Mexico together. Weston came back to the United States. She remained in Mexico. And, well, she had a very complicated and interesting life. She went to the International Brigade in, in Spanish Civil War in, in, in then after in the war, war, World War II. She was involved with the Communist Party. She went to Moscow, she went to Berlin, she went to... And then she came back to Mexico, 
Well, the first time she was expelled from Mexico, then she, she, could, she came back to Mexico. She was not, she was only 40 something, and she died in a mysterious way. Uh, I claim there was only a heart attack. Some people said she was murdered by Stalin, etc. Well, it's a very interesting story. And uh, I made a script on that film, on that project that was completely silent. It was going to be like a silent film, black and white, uh, mainly using the style of her photographs and the photographs of Edward West Ham, etc. That was the excuse or the reason to think of doing a, a, a film without dialogues to express the story only with facts, with action, and with a way of watching those facts and narrating those. I mean, there is, an, a, way of, there is a way of narrating, of uh, making liaison from one thing to another, and etc. But uh, in that case, it began with a style preoccupation, let's say justified by the dramatic material that we were going to use, but it started from that point of view. Maybe what led me to that is that I was fed up with films that I watched in which dialogue, I, I think it was completely unnecessary. I mean, it was, it was not, not that I'm, I'm against dialogue in all films, but uh, in many films, you say, well, well, what is he talking about? Well, he's telling you what I'm already seeing. Uh, what, what's the use of uh, words uh, if you're not... And at the same time, you don't have uh, a work of the, of the sound, uh, a sound uh, uh, track. I mean, it's not only music, it's noises, it's uh, silence even, etc. Finally, we didn't do the Tina Modotti film and we made the Frida Kahlo film. But the idea was still there, so I didn't go so far as doing a completely uh, soundless uh, or dialogueless film. But I went into that direction. And the result was for me very interesting because the reaction of the people. I've been always very much interested in Brecht, in, in, in Brecht in, in, in theater or Brecht in films. And the famous distance effect, etc., etc. And although I didn't do it at the beginning, I didn't do it for that. I found out that it was very helpful for that because it's, as you, you mentioned the word provocation. I don't know if you can provoke many things, but w what it provoked at the first time is a different attitude from the audience to the screen that obliges you to think. And that's the basic thing when you think of Brecht. I mean, it's how to make, how to move the brain of, 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 of somebody watching a theater uh, show or, or a film or whatever. Uh, and to think in, let's say, in certain direction, to think in certain things, not to impose a way of thinking, but I mean, to more or less say, look, here, I'm telling you a story and I hope you you'll find it amusing and that you are not going to be bored, but I want you to think about what I'm telling you. And, uh, and not only to, to listen to a story and then forget about the story, or why, why this story and not another story, or why this story happens the way it's being told to me in, in this film. And for that purpose, silence, I think, was very useful. And I think that more or less responds to me. <laughs> well, I read that you said once the Mexican cinema is a perfect disaster composed of vulgar, cheap, and badly made films. I said is that. true? Or <laughs> do you still think like that? Or do you see a change in the Latin American cinema through the last years? When did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> I had it for an interview, so <laughs> I was really interested in this. No, well, no, what's new in the Mexican film uh, movement now, it's as we were talking downstairs, yeah. there's a lot, a lot of uh, younger, talented uh, filmmakers. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I 
was wrong when I said that because it's still that way for most of the. I mean, uh, it's a generalization. Now you cannot generalize as much as uh, at many at that moment it was. It's like all films in all over the world that are sometimes better than sometimes worse. Um, no, I think I answered that downstairs. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's not. Um, and just as you said, 50,000 people or 5,000 people are studying in these filmmaking schools and stuff like that. So why do you think it is so attractive to young people to make films? Or where is the fascination in, in so many people? Why is, this, where is the boom? Where is the, the boom coming from? Is it just because of the cameras and the possibilities? Or? When I decided to make films, is because I thought that making films would allow me to know, to get acquainted with Marilyn Monroe, for instance. <laughs> I never got acquainted, <laughs> I never saw her, <laughs> except for, for own films. And uh, it's always glamorous, I mean, it's always it's, it's some sort of an attraction. Uh, in a way, it's true, I wouldn't be here if not... Uh, um, films allow you to travel and to meet people. Uh, even if it's only that, it's already attractive. No? Mm. The fact that now it's easier to make films, I think, helps to make more people believe that that attraction is possible at that, that level. No? And it sounds easy. It sounds that if I have an idea of, I know a joke and I want to say the joke, it's enough to make a script about it. No? Little by little you start finding out that it's not so easy and to write a story or to get the money or to get the money back or to make the second film or whatever. But then there's too late. I mean, you already became a filmmaker. Or at least you made one that <laughs> you started in that, in that road. Now, as, 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 now I don't know what's going to happen because I'm telling you about what, what, the way it used to be. Now, as I said, it depends a lot for you, or for you, I mean, as a generation and all over the world, not only here, that you're able to build up something that goes further than your films. Uh, it's an industry, a way of, 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 of producing, uh, producing products, no matter what kind of films. I'm not uh, talking about that now. Oh, they're good films, they're interested, etc. But even these, they're commercial films, let's say. They cannot be the way they used to be. This financial crisis, it has nothing to do with films at the beginning, but it's also uh, not yet in a complete way, but it's going to influence the way of, you have, for instance, talking about Mexican filmmaker Guillermo del Toro. You know who he is, of course, and, and, and he's made, a, well, he went to Thailand to prepare a film for years and he was paid fortunes and all that, and the film was not done because they didn't have the money to make it, no. So you, it's, not, it's not only a, of, the, of the examples that I've been giving, which is a new film, young filmmaker is trying to make his second film, even Guillermo del Toro. It's very difficult for him to make an, a new film in the way he wants to make films. He was used to make films. Do you think it's like, like Guillermo del Toro or Inarito, these people, they all, at some point, they went to the States to do films with Hollywood? Do you think it's, you were never interested to make this compromise to work, work together with this? Uh, big industry to, to do what you want? No, not really. Not really. What we were trying to do, I, I went I went to the Sundance uh, mm -hmm. laboratory invited yeah. by, the, by, by the Robert Redford group, etc. I went with a Brazilian uh, filmmaker. We were the first Latin Americans to go there. She had a... Uh, Susana Amaral, maybe you know her. It's, uh, it's an interesting case because it's a woman that made her first film when she was already a grand, uh, a grand uh, uh, abuela, como se dice, uh, granddaughter. She had a uh, grandma. She was not so old, but she was 50-something, but I mean, 
She started making films at that time. She made a film, the first film was very interesting, called La Hora de la Estrella. Anyway, we went together and I went mainly, because I wanted to see how it worked for the script discussions and all that, but mainly to try to convince them. Well, we were invited because they had at that moment something they called the Latin American Project. They wanted to relate with Latin American filmmakers. Usually, the, traditionally, the way they understood that is, and what finally they're doing, is to detect all where, where they can find talent. If they find uh, Eric von Stroheim here, they take Eric von Stroheim to, to Hollywood. Instead of giving Eric von Stroheim the money to make a film in Austria. No? Well, it's different because it was the war and all that. But, uh, but it was the same thing. If uh, Walter Salles in Brazil uh, is an interesting director, instead of, well, they began by giving a certain amount of money for him to make a film in Brazil, but mainly, and now he's doing, he's living in the United States, etc. Et or the Guillermo del Toro. So the intention was to try to convince them to not to do that. I mean, the, 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 we also wanted to, we needed also an approach with them and the, the, we could think many formulas of co collaboration and, and working together, etc. But tried to convince them not to do what they, but we failed. I mean, they're still, they're still, they're still they keep it away. Yeah. So, um, but that was not the, what was the question? <laughs> you were never tempted to, oh. to go? Uh, no, really or? not, because uh, uh, no, <laughs> it was not attractive enough. <laughs> It's, uh, I have to go back to your question you made before if about not only this film and yeah. many films. The way we worked, I worked at least, has always been uh, lacking of uh, enough money, enough uh, whatever. Sometimes it affects the way you do the film, sometimes you can find a way of uh, not having so much trouble from that point of view. In that case, uh, it was a horrible story from the beginning. First of all, I didn't want to make the film because uh, I was already thinking of getting out of the film industry, etc., etc., but I had uh, some engagements that obliged me to, to, to do it. Then we, as you, have you seen the film? I just read it. Um. Well, everything happens in a, in a nightclub. It's the story of a real, it's a real story. It's based on a real story that happened in Panama during the American invasion. That uh, a girl working in one of these uh, nightclubs uh, was killed by an American soldier. And uh, it's a very short, uh, thing in the newspaper, no mm, details were given, except, well, they got the soldier for a few days in jail and then they, he went free. And uh, based on that, we built up a musical film that needed uh, dancers and choreographers and etc. Otherwise, there was no film. When we started, we had a, a the luck that a, 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 a very uh, important uh, group of Cuban dancers and uh, they were in Mexico. The best that I ever seen, even what I saw in Cuba. So we conjured them, we started rehearsing with them and uh, they got involved in a very complicated story. One of them, one of the girls was involved with one of important politicians and the wife of the politician, it's as, as ridiculous as I'm, as, as, as I'm telling you. The wife of the politician gave orders that this group has, to, the whole group has to go out of. <laughs> and we tried to, uh, we, and we were starting the film with no actors. It was a big mess. Uh, I was working with a co 
choreographer and he went to some places where another group of out of Mexico City, but in Mexico as a country. He went to some place, I went to another place to find if we could take a dancer from here and that right. Like and all with no rehearsing we started shooting the film. And, and that's the way it started. The whole film was like this. I mean it was full of absurd, stupid problems. And we didn't finish the what I was supposed to shoot, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So well maybe that explains <laughs> part of it. Then at the end, well, even the end was, it was invited to the San Sebastian film, which I consider absurd to go because the film was not finished, we didn't have time enough to finish. We were obliged to make a one hour 30 version, where we have no material for one hour 30. We sent the copy because we had to remix the sound in Paris in order to be in time for San Sebastian. Air France lost the negatives for a couple of weeks. Everything happened in that film. So, so uh, <laughs> that's the kind of things that are not so glamorous <laughs> that you don't think when you want to um, make a film. And that happened. Sometimes it happened, sometimes it's not. Uh, in that case, everything happened. So, and besides, I don't like the film. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> as, as a film. I mean, it's. Uh, Documentary about not making the film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's a good way to make people curious about this movie, to not talk about yeah. it. <laughs> no, because, well, finally, finally I made a. Because, well, after all, there are contracts and producers, etc., etc. Because I, uh, the only thing that I thought that could rescue it up to a certain point in the material was to do a shorter version, a one hour, well, 50 something minutes for television version, to use whatever more or less you could use on, on the film. So finally I made that version, but now nobody is distributing it, so it's useless. <laughs> so it's like, uh, like this case, you, the, 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 the copies you can find are from the one hour and 30 minutes, which is ridiculous. Film was, how did you feel it, or was it just... No, when I, when I decided, when I, I decided that in Brazil, I was invited to, to make, a, there was a, a producer in France that wanted to make a series of uh, five or six films um, with a very interesting list of filmmakers. At that time, there was Kiarostami, there was Alain Taner, there was Yoseliani, myself, one from each continent, mm -hmm. and he wanted to make stories of sports. Um, he proposed me to make something on, on Veracruz. The only thing that he wanted is that they were not historical films, that not, were not too expensive, but to find something that happened in one port uh, that could be interesting enough to make a, a film about it. A short film? Hmm? Short film? No, no, one hour. One hour yeah. uh, Co-producing with television, it was a TV and film, but one, one hour thirty. And uh, in Veracruz, which is a place I know quite a lot, and, and they're very good stories, but not, not, not recent. Uh, yeah. Recent is a place that's a bit boring because it's dying. It used to be an important port, now it's not, etc. And I had uh, I had a... Um, an idea of something. I, I proposed him to, 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 to use it. He wanted Latin America, not necessarily Mexico or Veracruz. So I proposed to him to make it in Manaus, in Brazil, which was something I liked because it's a port in the middle of the jungle. I mean, it's not even <laughs> in the sea. But in that region, I've heard about a story that's some sort of a myth that you can find in Brazil, in Colombia, or Venezuela but in also in the, mainly in the Amazonian region. It changes in one place it's about gold, in some places about em emeralds yeah. or diamonds. It's about the miner that finds a gold or an emerald, uh, a very important piece of gold, and uh, 
but I mean, he he has nothing. He can do anything with the, with the piece himself. He sells it to a British or a Dutch uh, company of uh, international, transnational, uh, and he gets a lot of money. Not the value of the piece, but important for him. <coughs> so he goes to the next town, which is full of cantinas and bordelos and etc., and invites people to drink and to be around for a couple of weeks and spends all his money and he has to come back to, to do the same work, you know. And Galeano, in one of his books, uh, has this uh, story. And it's something that you, you, you feel, that you, you, you can find it uh, in that region. You listen to the variations of the same story. So I propose this story because what I wanted to do I was obsessed with the photographs of, uh, of uh, Sebastián Salgado, of the uh, mine that you have seen in the film. That, uh, the mine that, uh, the, that, uh, that appears in, uh, in, uh, in Cobrador. I don't know if, you've, if you know the, uh, the photographs in which it's based. No? Go to internet put Sebastián Salgado, Mina Pelada, Sierra Pelada, and see those photographs, they are incredible. The, the, the photographs of the real mine, uh, where 50,000 workers were looking for gold. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew the photographs for many years before, and I was obsessed with doing something on, on that. And uh, so I proposed this uh, story in Manaus and all that together to make uh, uh, the film. And when we met in Brazil to find locations, and et cetera, et cetera, I realized that I didn't want to make the film, that I, uh, that I was fed up with the fact of, with the kind of life that I was living. That's the real problem. Mm -hmm. that to make a film as a Mexican filmmaker meant, and you can see it in this film that you've seen, the list of credits. There's money from France, from Spain, from Great Britain, from uh, Brazil, from etc, etc, etc. And it's a big mess to do that. And uh, I was living in Mexico, but I was almost never in Mexico. I had kids, I had, I was, well, my personal life was a mess. And uh, I was set up. So I said to this guy, look here, thank you very much, but I will not want to do the film. Finally, he didn't make the series, so it was not so long. <laughs> but if he would, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be in the list. It was mainly that. I mean, I had, uh, it got to a point in which I thought that I, not that I made all that I wanted to make, absolutely not, in films, but that I was not going to do, I would not get more satisfaction from films than what I already had. I already made it in a certain amount of films, not too many, but enough, etc., uh, etc., et and it was good, but uh, I could do other things in life, and I'd rather do other things in life. So it's definitely. <laughs> well, that was many years ago, in fact. Cobrador that you just saw was, there's a big gap between that and those before. And that was because I, well, I already found out that, that, that films, it's like a, a malady, how to say malady, an illness uh, that can be cured. I mean, that I, I was already uh, desintoxicado. But, uh, I read a story by Ruben Fonseca, which is called Cobrador, which is a, well, the film that you see over compacted in three pages. It's very strong. It's a story about this guy uh, that started in, uh, killing people with apparently no reason. And, uh, and I thought that there was a film that I wanted to do there because that feeling of violence that was growing in Mexico but all over the world, I thought that was a subject that needed uh, to be talked and, 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 and that that story was a very good way of doing it. 
And I did a, f uh, a script, I wrote a script. Well, it was not enough to make a film on that because it's really very short, very short. And the strength of the, of, of the story is precisely there. It's very short and uh, uh, if you, from that, do some sort of a novel instead of a short story, you would uh, lose the, the whole, the whole mean, the whole violence of the of the thing. So I look for other stories. Rumor like uh, he has wrote many novels and hundreds of, of short stories. And the best, at least the ones that I like, are what they call the black, black short stories of Fonseca, which are dealing with crimes. And so I took about two or three other stories, and with those stories I made the, the new script. And um, and one day I got a phone call for a friend, a cameraman that I. Uh, the news script, and he told me, are you watching TV? No, why? It was 8 in the morning. Put the TV because your story's on TV. And I put it, it was the 9-11. Because the, the, the script that I had at that time started with exterior day, uh, New York, uh, Twin Towers, etc. Of course, the story was different. But, uh, but it started like that, and it ended with the same song that Tom Zay song, that, uh, that if, who's going to put the bomb in the beginning of the century, you know? Um, so it was a problem because <laughs> a week before I was in Canada discussing with producers that were going to do it and give us money to, to make the film. We were going to do the New York part that was already on the script, and to do it in Canada, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But after the 9/11, nobody wanted, no producer wanted to produce a film, not only talking about that, but that it was a violent film or a film about violence, because finally it's a film about violence. I'm not sure if it's a violent film because you don't see blood and you don't see um, you see violence in, in different ways, but not not in the Tarantino way, let's say, so another way. But anyway, for a couple of years, nobody wanted to put a penny on, on that kind of story, so the story was forgotten. And then, well, little by little, it was reconstructed. I had to change the, the script. Finally, I put at the end this uh, allusion to the 9-11. Uh, and well, that was set. You're not like um, you're still teaching at the school. Or? No, no, no. Many years ago, I don't. Uh, no, 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 no. But you're not tempted to do like short films or things like that. Or no, it's the same as to do a short project. film or a long film. It's once or you do it or you don't do it. But if you do it, yeah. I will. No, I, I, the contrary. I always said that it's so complicated to make a film. I mean, to get the money, to get the people, to get the everything you need. That once you're going to do it, you can do it as complicated as you wish because it's. <laughs> I mean, for instance, Cobrador is shot in Argentina, I mean, in Buenos Aires, in Rio de Janeiro, in Minas Gerais, in Mexico, in Guadalajara, in New York. Uh, I use three different cameramen, I use, I think there were seven different crews in each place, and Argentina went once, then we went back for another part. We did the interiors of New York and Argentina, we did over. It's not more, it's not more complicated than doing a film only here in Innsbruck. Yeah. No, I mean, it's uh, at the end of the same complication. As a matter of fact, it became easier to get the money because then if you go and shoot a week in Argentina, then you get money from there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So, um, no, but, but I mean, like, uh, just last year, Chris Marker died, and he, uh, they, they talked about him, and, and they, uh, he once said, yeah, he's so, uh, uh, now he's so um, into making his films because he doesn't need any people, he can do it on his own with one camera and sit at home at his computer and do something and, like, just short. Uh, no, well, I, I, what I did, 
No, 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 I quit cinema, as I said, for very concrete reasons and for many years. One day, by chance, I met in the street the, 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 um, the son of a friend that I met him when he was uh, very small. He was a large guy. And what are you doing? And he was doing, uh, working with computers and all that, and he was doing animation. He was thinking of doing animation. I always liked animation, I never did animation, because it was too complicated and it was like a different thing, activity. But it was the beginning of the possibility of doing it with computers. I'm talking about the late 90s. So uh, I went to see his place and I talked with the people that worked with him. And finally we had the idea of doing something with animation because we were all, they were interested from the computer point of view, I was interested from another point of view. So I, I made, we made a half an hour uh, uh, thing for, for children, which were 20, I think it was, 20 songs, traditional Mexican songs, uh, talking about animals. And we made one in 2D, in two dimension animation, another in 3D animation, another combining one and another, in different styles, mainly to see what happened. No? And once it was made, well, I went to the, Secretary of the Ministry of Education, and they were interested, and they bought it, etc. Et so I started to make animation for a while, which is more or less what you were saying, but it was not because I wanted to make films in another way. Of course, I made a joke that it was very, if you didn't like an actor, you just put control Z and it disappear, the actor or whatever. No? And it's a completely different way of doing it. It's a screw. Here we can make uh, two crews or to make animation of the kind of... But also, then the problem became, as usual, the problem of distribution. Uh, when we made, when we were work, working on this very elementary way of doing uh, uh, animation, I remember the Time magazine came out with a cover of Toy Story was being done at the time. We didn't see the film at the time, we saw it months later. But the, the data of how it was, how many people were working in, in doing Toy Story with what kind of, uh, of computers and all that. And we made the, uh, well not me, but the guys in, that knew about that sort of mathematics, uh, did the calculum. Working as with the team we had, how much time we would need to make a film like Toy Story, it was about 340 something years. <laughs> so, well, that gives you an idea. But it was fun because it was really a very small group, uh, uh, working at the rhythm, etc., uh, etc. Et but when you go out with distribution, although we had a good uh, reception from, from kids at the time. We made some screenings, uh, testing screenings, et cetera, et cetera. But you cannot compete. I mean, it's absolut absolutely impossible to compete with, 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 with Toy Story, or Walt Disney, or whatever. And uh, even though, because, I, uh, uh, well, uh, then we make a story of, of music for kids uh, that I made with the Minister of Education, and they had the rights for schools, and I had the rights for selling it in the streets, well, in the stores. But you need the same infrastructure to distribute the Toy Story than to distribute a small thing like this, because uh, uh, we need three copies to uh, have some store in some place, and we need four copies. Uh, finally, you cannot, uh, so finally I retired from the market. Now I'm working, uh, I, I came back to that project recently uh, in a different way and maybe we're doing part of the internet, part of the, it's a long story, it's a long story has nothing to do with, with films now, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. No, thank you.